tonight she's going to talk about what everybody has on their mind right now, and that's Pi, of course. And she's going to talk about the history of Pi. Um, if you haven't attended one of these lectures before, uh, our presenter is Sarah Lohman, and she's the author of Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine. Uh, released in 2016 with Simon & Schuster, Eight Flavors is a number one bestseller on Amazon, and The Atlantic called the book richly researched, intriguing, and cleverly written. Uh, formerly the curator of food programming at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, she has lectured at hundreds of universities and institutions nationwide, including the Museum of Science in Boston, the American Museum of Natural History, and the New York Public Library. So again, tonight's program is all about pie. Um, in this talk, Sarah will look at the origins of pie, including meat pies and coffins. Huh. And then we'll delve deep into the history of pumpkin pie and apple pie, stopping for digressions into the pumpkin spice flavor craze. Oh, that's, that's going to be good. And the history of competitive pie eating. So this talk sounds super fun. I'm so excited that she can be online with us again tonight. And if you have any questions, send them to the chat or use the Q&A module. And um, Sarah usually can handle them herself, or I will uh, try to manage them for her. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be back at my favorite library in New England. I'm always thrilled to be talking to you. So let's get in the mood for Thanksgiving, which I can't believe is a week away. I feel like it really snuck up on me this year. Um, but it is my favorite holiday because of the profusions of pies that are involved. And we'll even see that historically there used to be more pies up Jersey Shore. I also love pies. Um, and by the way, yeah, if you have questions, pop them in the chat, put them in the Q&A, uh, and we'll try to answer as we go along too, but I'll leave some space at the end in case you have any as well. So historically, there were more pies involved in Thanksgiving as well. Um, but so I will say that, you know, we're going to we're gonna cover a lot of apple and pumpkin pie history, and we're gonna use those as examples to trace pie history. So we might not get to like the all the your favorite pie. Like we're not gonna talk about chess pie today. We're not gonna to talk about chiffon pie. We're not gonna talk about, uh, actually we are gonna talk about mince meat and mince pie. But my point being that if you would love to indulge in more pie history after this talk, I highly recommend the foodtimeline.org. That's foodtimeline.org. This site used to be run by one incredible librarian and researcher. And now um, after, unfortunately, she passed away, it's being handled by I think the University of Virginia's culinary department. And you can go on there and learn any bit of pie history you want to know. So if I don't cover something in our brief time together tonight, please head out over there and check out the pie and pastry section and you will definitely be satisfied. So let's talk a little bit about where the word pie comes from. So um, it's believed to actually just be a shortening of the word magpie. And if you're familiar with magpies, magpies are birds that are that famously like to collect things. They like to collect sparkly things. And they kind of hoard them in their nest. So early pies were essentially, um, in a way, homemade cooking vessels. The crust themselves were very, very sturdy and not meant to be consumed, into which you put whatever you had, whether that be like leftovers from lunchtime or from the day before, you can basically throw a lot of different things in there and make a whole new hearty meal. Or alternately, if you are hunting and you've caught a bunch of small game birds or even songbirds, which were eaten historically too, you can take all of those little things and put them into one big pie. So this term, uh, the earliest written reference we have to it is from 1303. It's in common use by the 1360s. And the print, print legs behind, uh, even to this day, what the common usage is too. So even though we see it in print in 1303, that means that people were definitely using this term um, in the early 13th century, in the 1200s as well. So, so pie allegedly comes from magpie. Now, I mentioned this crust already. If we have any uh, Great British Bake Off fans out there, and if any of you have already seen the finale, no spoilers, please. Um, I know it plays tomorrow in America, but there are ways. There are ways to find out. Um, so these, when they have those um, like pastry episodes where they make game pies, often like these really multi-tiered, elaborate, like molded pies, 
that is obviously something we don't do in America and really never have. It's a real throwback to like medieval England that still survives in some capacity. Um, so those sort of, even though in Bake Off, when they make the crust, it tends to be the edible crust. It is usually a very simple one that's just like flour and lard. So historically, you were just basically constructing a cooking vessel out of flour and, uh, and, and fat, essentially, usually lard. And these were famed to be so firm that if you rolled a wagon over them, um, the wagon wheel would break, not the crust of the pie. So again, think more of these, think of it more as a cooking vessel, not something that you're going to consume with the pastry. We see that shift happen more in the 18th century or what I generally refer to as the early modern era as opposed to the Middle Ages or the Renaissance. But true to the sort of lordly compositions of the Middle Ages and especially the Renaissance, they were often incredibly fancy. Um, for example, Historically, one of the things you would do is uh, originally all pies were meat pies. Fruit pies don't really come about until the 16th century. So they were often pies, again, filled with like whole stewed small birds or a combination of game meats. And if you were making a pie out of a specific bird in the kitchen, uh, in the Middle Ages, you would often have like a taxidermied head and wing that you would then like stick into the pie as part of the decoration before you sent it out to the table. Now, of course, this is, we're talking lords and ladies and kings and queens here. Everybody was making pies that had access to grains, um, but only the wealthiest people were making uh, weird bird, fancy bird pies. And by the Renaissance, this technique actually changes a little bit to where uh, when you have a game bird, uh, even something as fancy as a swan or a peacock, you take the skin off the bird, you roast the meat inside, and then I'm a little unclear if you put the whole roasted bird back into the skin and feathers or if it's cut up in pieces, I'm not sure. But basically then you serve like a whole swan to the table that has the cooked meat inside. And in both of these examples, the taxidermied ones or the skinned ones, um, they would often be decorated with gold leaf and strings of pearls. So it could look really crazy impressive even beyond the crust. Um, okay, practical questions. Live transcript, which I believe is up now. I'm gonna get rid of that. And we will let you know how to answer the recording later. The library can help you with that. Um, okay. So the idea here is that these are a vessel and pies are sort of considered the earliest convenience food in a way too, because you produced a lot of pies this time of year in the fall. This is of course, when you've got your harvest in, where you've got a proliferation of grain, but also this is when you're doing a lot of your butchering. So all that whole animal needs to be processed pretty quickly. That would start with things like the blood and the organs. Sorry, I bet you didn't think that the pie talk was gonna be this gross today, but like. I would say it's just me and I always throw something gross in there, but honestly, just food is gross. We're kind of removed from this process. When you butcher an animal, you have to use the parts that go bad first. So that's gonna be something like the blood and the organ meats. And then larger joints of meat you can preserve through smoking or salting, but then any sort of like little bits and pieces, those are the sorts of things that you're gonna bake into pies. And mincemeat is the sort of modern descendant of what some of these pies were like. Now, again, calling it back to Bake Off, if you've seen it, they're just like cramming so many weird meats in there, even in these ways that you can like cut it and there's like eggs and designs in there. Um, but another version of this pie was mixing uh, scraps of meat with a lot of spices, which in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance really taught was uh, like conspicuous consumption. Only very wealthy people could afford spice, in Europe, which was coming from China, India, Indonesia. Um, and so a lot of the spices that today we consider to be like sweet spices that we use with baking were used just as commonly with meat as black pepper. Um, mincemeat also usually has today things like raisins and apples. Apples, of course, being in season. Raisins, another very expensive ingredient for the Middle Ages and the Renaissance as well. So mincemeat is a sort of like halfway point between the meat pies of the early of the Middle Ages and then the fruit pies that we see come about in the Renaissance. Today, minced meat usually doesn't have meat in it. It's usually like grated apples, dried fruits, um, still popular in Britain. The last time I was there was in 2016. And one of the things I like to do when I'm going 
not just a different country, but often a different region in America is I like to visit the Starbucks and the McDonald's because they're surprisingly regional. And in the Starbucks, in McDonald's, in London and Edinburgh, you could get little mincemeat pies, which you would never ever see here. And by the way, yeah, uh, McDonald's in America, digression, are very regional. Like if you go to New Mexico, there, there's chili sauce available for your burger. If you go to Gilroy, California, where, where most of America's garlic is grown, you can get garlic fries in season. It's cute to a certain extent. I think that that's really fascinating when a big corporate change like that, chain like that makes changes. So um, although I've never, don't think I've ever actually had a mincemeat pie. I would just read about it in books when I was a kid, books that were like written in the 1930s. Out of curiosity, does anybody make mincemeat around the holidays? Pop it in the chat, I'm curious. But at least in concept, we know this in America as a pie that still exists. And this is a descendant of those medieval meat pies and a transitional pie, if you will. So mentioned already, we start to see fruit pies in the 16th century. Um, oh, your mom does. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, and you love it, Karen. So, so it is a tradition out there. I, I, it feels very New England, which is why I put that out there. I'm originally from the Midwest, and this was not a part of our pie repertoire. Um, but it, you know, it does exist for, to a certain extent. And I'm going to assume, Karen and Diane, you don't actually use any meat in your mincemeat pie. Uh, or your mom specifically. If you want to throw some ingredients in there, I'm really curious to what your the family recipes are. Um, fruit pies, as I mentioned, they start coming about in the 16th century. Um, oh, I love this. <laughs> Sorry, I'm stopping to look at a, a few questions. Um, Johanna says, English great grandmother used to make it. That makes total, total sense. Um, Another two great questions from Joyce. Would you call something like Jamaican beef patties pies? I grew up eating them school lunch in Brooklyn, NYC. Of course, love a Jamaican meat patty. Uh, I would actually. I mean, of course, like ugh. we can really have a bigger argument at what the definition of pie is, but yeah, it's pastry with a filling. It's basically a hand pie, right? Um, if you went on a general pie tour of the United States, where would you go to? You see this, but you don't remember the route, probably included Route 66. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. I mean, that sounds like, something I should do, <laughs> honestly. And now that you planted the idea, something that I will plan. Um, I have to say this will be surprising, but some of the best pies I've ever had that weren't homemade were in Hawaii. Um, the Hawaiian people, I mean, all indigenous people were indigenous heritage month, incredibly adaptable, had to be, but we're also, I know Grace, smart and like, um, using Hawaii as an example, you know, very late in the Western colonization, really uh, first contact was just before the 18th century um, with uh, Cook was the first person. By the 1830s, there are uh, American missionaries from, the, from Massachusetts, I believe from the Boston area there. And basically the Hawaiian people took like what they wanted from white culture and then made it their own. And in some cases made it better and more beautiful. So one great example is Hawaiian quilting. If you've never looked it up, give it a Google. It's extraordinarily beautiful and both the same and different as what you might see in New England. But like the Hawaiian people also just loved pies. And there are some really incredible pie restaurants. I went to one when I was there on Kauai. I'd have to look up the name, um, but I was there with a friend and I think we first went and ordered three different slices and then decided to go back and eat two more. So between the two of us, we had five slices of pie in one sitting. And it was just like, all of it was amazing. And some of it was tropical and cream pies are really a thing. And it's just like, that is, I think I've had some of the best pies of my life in um, Hawaii. It's the right sauce. I'd have to think about it. Um, oh yeah, diner pies. I have also been, if there's any Twin Peaks fans out there, the r, &R restaurant actually does exist. It's in Eastern Washington. And of course you can get a damn fine slice of cherry pie there. And you know what? I'm not actually a fan of cherry pie and it is pretty damn good there. So, I mean, that would definitely have to be in the pie tour, but I think you could probably go to Hawaii and just do a pie tour and be really, really happy. So speaking of these kind of like custardy fluffy pies, Ooh, the mango pie from the right slice. The right slice, that's what, okay. I thought it was the right sauce. Yeah, it is the right slice in Kauai. Yes, and we had like a lily koi um, meringue pie. Like it was in like a chocolate chiffon. It was so good and there was no shame. We were so happy with ourselves. Um, 
<laughs> did you believe artery clogging suet, Joanna? I am sure. So suet, you can sometimes find it in grocery stores too, but usually in America, we are more, I mean, it's sort of interesting. We're sort of more of a, a pig-based culture historically when it comes to cooking fats, which is weird though, because we had a lot more dairy cows than most other nations. Um, we're, we're really a milk people. So it is, is interesting that we don't generally use suet. Um, suet is beef fat, which tends, which can be an ingredient in pastry. More often it is an ingredient in like traditional plum puddings, like uh, British pud, which isn't like pudding, like jello pudding. They're often like fat plus bread, plus spices, plus dried fruits, maybe a little booze, you bake it or you boil it. So that's so interesting that your great, your great grandmother from England definitely used to it. I believe that. Oh, Mary, so there are some great mince pie recipes online. Use green tomatoes, interesting. So almost a little savory, a little um, savory and like um, sour too. Green tomatoes, apples with raisins and spices. Make a big pot of this and use it over yogurt. Oh, in oatmeal or with ice cream or pie. I actually hadn't thought that you could sort of use it as like a compote, almost like a granola. That's so fascinating. And with green tomatoes, that's so smart because right before that last frost, you got to get all those unripe tomatoes off of your plants and figure out what to do with them, right? Um, so the earliest fruit pies that were coming out in the 16th century, they were fruit stewed with sugar, but they were also usually custards. So something like a pumpkin pie, which we're going to get more into, is a kind of a direct descendant of these late medieval and early Renaissance fruit pies. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't know the date of this image off the top of my head, but I think it's like a really sweet and funny image. This is a mobile pie oven that was used in like a religious parade. Part of the reason we know it was a re religious parade is because up in the corner, you can see pretzels, which in the Middle Ages were often associated with religious festivals or like uh, sort of given away on first communions and things like that. There's some belief that maybe the pretzel is actually uh, shaped after hands in prayer. Um, but so this pie was like baking pies, literally a la carte, and then they could pass them out, or I don't know if they were selling them or just giving them out to the audience as they rolled along, which I think is really sweet and hilarious. And what they're baking there, you know, really looks like a typical custard pie. If it were a little bit darker, it would look like a pumpkin pie. So let's talk about some early pumpkin recipes, which come about, I, I, like, it really surprised me how early they're in the documentation. So I'll say first that pumpkins are, um, pumpkins and squash are generally a new world uh, vegetable, or are they a fruit? I always get a little confused as to what is what. They're a plant from the Americas, uh, grown all over the Americas by indigenous people. You know, there were hundreds, if not thousands of different varieties. Um, however, actually, let's come back to tort of pumpkin. There we go. So in uh, Europe, there was an old world squash, as it's known, that basically came from Asia. It's generally known as like the Asiatic squash. Um, I don't know what the texture of this, this squash was like. I've never seen it or been able to try it myself. Um, but it grew similarly to American squashes, but American squashes had like a better flavor and texture and were more robust growers. So after 1492, we have what's called the Columbian Exchange. That is the term that refers to the back and forth of literally different like plants and ingredients from the Americas to Europe, Africa, and Asia, and vice versa. So some of the really important foods that went from America to um, basically across the Atlantic Ocean are things like peanuts, are things like tomatoes. I mean, imagine Italian cuisine without tomatoes. Chili peppers are a food of the Americas too. Um, and of course, squashes. Now for a lot of these other ingredients, oh, chocolate is another one as well, vanilla. It took a couple generations. So we're talking you know, 50 to 100 years for these foods to be fully incorporated within European diets um, for people to get used to them and accept them. However, since there already existed this old world squash that was similar, uh, New World squashes caught on much more quickly, that people started growing pumpkins and other varieties of squashes a lot faster because they knew what to do with them and already sort of had recipes for them. So I'm going to read to you a couple really early uh, pumpkin pie recipes. This one is Torte o Pumpkin, and it is from 1653. It's from a book called The French Cook, uh, which is actually was written by a French chef, but for 
Uh, it was written in English. So it's essentially for like British gentry. And the recipe for tort of pumpkin is boil it with good milk, pass it through a straining pan very thick and mix it with sugar, butter, a little salt, if you will, a few stamped almonds, let it all be very thin. They mean the consistency of the, the batter. Thank you, Catherine. Pumpkin and squash is a fruit. Put it in your sheet of paste, bake it after it is baked, you sprinkle it with sugar and serve. So three, three interesting things about that recipe. Um, one is that it is basically a modern pumpkin pie recipe, right? So we're looking at a recipe that is coming up on 400 years old and it's essentially a pumpkin pie recipe. You cook the pumpkin, you mush it up, you, you actually cook this directly in milk, which I think is interesting. You mush it all up together. Um, you add sugar, they add butter, which is a little unusual, but I've seen that in 19th century recipes. Little almonds, we don't usually do that, but sounds tasty. And then you pour it into a tart crust. And this is an example, when they're saying a sheet of paste, they essentially mean like, like puff pastry. So this is a flaky buttery crust that is meant to be eaten, not those really, really hard, uh, crust that were essentially functioning as a casserole dish, right? And then, all right, so, oh, and then the third interesting thing is just be sprinkle it with sugar, which is just one of my favorite cooking directions I think I've ever read, be sprinkling it with sugar. So here's another one from just about 20 years later. Um, this is from The Complete Cook, another British cookbook, and it's a recipe for pumpkin pie, which was the English word for pumpkin. Take about half up excuse me, take about half a pound of pompion and slice it, a handful of thyme, a little rosemary, parsley, and sweet marjoram slipped off the stalks and chop them small. Then take the cinnamon, nutmeg, pepper, and six cloves and beat them. Now, this one is sort of fascinating because it's like sweet and savory spices. Um, there's no indication that you're going to add sugar or salt. <laughs> the recipe just kind of stops, honestly. Um, but it is something that I'm really curious to, to make. It's like somewhere between like a pumpkin, savory pumpkin pudding and a pumpkin pie. So those are a couple early, early recipes for pumpkin pie, 17th century British recipes for pumpkin pie. Of course, as soon as English colonists came to the new world, they were growing pumpkin patches. They had brought uh, English crops with them to places like the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, things like apple trees and wheat, but it, they had a really hard time growing them. All of the, the, not the saplings, all the cuttings they brought of apple trees basically died. They started growing apple trees here by planting them from seeds. And wheat is actually quite a fussy grain to grow and it grows really, really poorly in wet and cold conditions. So the earliest colonists were surviving mostly on rye, but they did have a course success with native crops, crops that were already adapted to that new region. And certainly, the British colonists would not have survived in any of these early colonies without the tutelage and the kindness and the generosity of the nearby native people. In the circumstance of Plymouth, that is the Wampanoag tribe that extended them not only generosity, but education that allowed them to survive, unfortunately, eventually to their own destruction and death. Um, first history of Thanksgiving is, is a whole, whole nother talk too. But of course, the Wampanoag were growing squash Locally, it's still known as a combination known as the three sisters, and that in a single hole, you put uh, a fish as fertilizer, and then you put your seed for corn, your seed for a bean, and your seed for a squash. Historic varieties of corn were actually quite tall. We didn't start breeding them shorter until the 20th century, so corn was 8 to 12 feet high. And then up that corn stalk, your bean poles would twine. And also, while corn takes nitrate out of the soil, bean puts it back in. And then all along the ground, you're going to have your squash, too, which is also going to be climbing up the corn stalks to a certain extent. So of course, colonial Americans, 17th century Americans were also cooking and eating pumpkins. And eventually they were making pumpkin pies because it was so difficult to grow wheat. Um, you know, you might not have a lot of grain available or, um, and additionally, you need some special types of ovens to be able to bake certain kinds of bread. So a, pump, a pie crust takes a lot less flour, a lot less fuss, and you can make it basically in any old oven. So pies were much more common in the British colonies in the United States uh, long before bread was. So the next pie I wanna touch on is apple pie, which is soon, all right, so 
when you plant apple from a seed, your orchard doesn't produce the same apple tree as the parent. Every, every apple seed contains different genetics than the parent, and every apple has five seeds in it. So in one tree, there can be thousands, if not tens of thousands of different genetic combinations. This is how apples have been such a successful plant because they are constantly producing all those genetic variabilities so that it can adopt, adapt to changes in their environment. So whereas the early English colonists tried to plant, plant cuttings and those trees died, if they planted seeds, it's essentially a, a self-selecting process of which trees thrived and which trees died. And then the next generation of seeds is even better adapted to that local climate. Unfortunately, early on, not a lot of those apples, only a small percentage of them were good for eating. Um, a lot of them were used to make hard cider, but cutting them up and mixing them with sugar and putting them in a pie was another good option to use a lot of like maybe not so good apples. So a few very early apple pie recipes from uh, the Americas. So this one for coddling tart is from uh, Martha Washington's cookery book is what it's called. Thank you for the mince pie recipes. If anyone is curious, there's mince pie recipes being put into the chat. Give them a whirl, make something, make something wild this holiday season. Why not? Wild and historical. Um, so Martha Washington's book of cookery is not like a published book that was out there. It was a private manuscript of Martha Washington. Actually, she had it when she was Martha Custis. It was given to her by her first husband's family on her wedding day to Daniel Custis. And this was a family manuscript that had been added to over perhaps hundreds of years and was sort of recopied and passed down to the daughter or daughter-in-law on their wedding day. So it includes recipes that stretch from the Middle Ages to the early modern era of the 18th century. So this is a really early American recipe for um, apple pie, and we don't actually quite know the date on it because we can't date the recipes. Since they're recopied, they're all written in the same hand. We don't know when they were added. Here it is. To make a coddling tart, either look clear or green. First coddle, which means to poach, the apples in fair water, then take half the weight in sugar and make as much syrup as will cover the bottom of your preserving pan. And the rest of your sugar keep to throw on them as they boil, which must be very softly. And you must turn them often lest they burn too. Then put them in a thin tart crust, give them with their syrup half an hour's baking, where if you please, you may serve them up in a handsome dish, only garnish with sugar and cinnamon. If you would have your apples look green, coddle them in fair water, then pull them and put them into the, to your water again and cover them very close. Then lay them in your coffins of paste with low sugar and bake them not too hard. When you serve them up, put in with a tunnel as many as you please, a little thick sweet cream. So we have not talked about that word coffin. So coffin means a box. It's an old English word for a box. So when we call something that we bury somebody in a coffin, we're just using literally a, a maybe thousand year old word for a box. So pie crust in the middle ages, or again, we don't know exactly when this recipe came from, um, that word was in use at least to the 17th century, are not named after the boxes that we bury people in. It's just the old English word for a box. And the boxes that we bury people, bury people in are using that medieval word. Um, additionally, so I, I refer to them as one of the earliest convenience foods because these crusts were like so hard and indestructible that you'd make all these pies during the harvest season, sweet and savory, and then you would put them usually in a shed outside and they would freeze over the winter. So then when you needed a quick dinner or dessert or there was unexpected company, you could just walk out to your pie shed, get a pie and pop it in the oven to thaw it out. And one of the techniques with like taking these frozen pies is um, there's lots of instructions for how to like pop off the top of the crust, the top of the coffin, and you'd put some things in it to sort of like refresh it. Um, that was often rose water, which was a really common ingredient both in um, medieval and Renaissance Europe and also in early America too, because vanilla was undiscovered and then not very widespread. Um, you put like rose water, you put some sugar, you sprinkle it, um, you'd put some hunks of butter. And in this case, she's inviting you to fill each of the apples with cream because these are whole apples, not like slices of apples. 
Another really early American recipe is a 1615 apple pie. Now I will say that I, I made a variation of this using the seasonings from the 1615 manuscript recipe, but I modernized it by like cutting up the apples and making it with an edible crust, but that wasn't the original intention. Um, a, I'll read you the recipe. Um, so, oh, excuse me, this actually isn't a manu manuscript recipe. It's from the English Housewife, which is one of the first cookbooks that was brought to America. We didn't have our own. Um, yeah, that's good. Coffin becomes castic, to hold up casket, to hold something precious. Burial grounds become cemeteries. Interesting. Etymology, I love it. This is from the English housewife. We didn't have a cookbook written and published in America until the late 18th century. So for anyone coming before that, they would have brought British cookbooks with them. The recipe goes, take of the fairest and best pippins, that is specifically an apple that is uh, grown from a seed, and pair them and make a hole on the top of them, then prick each in a hole, a clove or two, then put them into the coffin and break in whole sticks of cinnamon and slices of orange peels and dates. And on top of every pippin, a little piece of sweet butter. Then fill the coffin and cover the pippins over with sugar. Then close up the pie and bake it as you bake pies of like nature. Hope you know how to bake pies of like nature. And when it is baked, baked, anoint the lid over with a store of sweet butter and then strew sugar upon it in good thickness and set it in the oven again for a little space as whilst the meat is dishing up and then serve it. Oh, that's interesting. So if you put butter and thick sugar on top, it's going to create almost like a caramelized top. So that indicates that this actually is sort of a, a coffin that's intended to be eaten unless it just looks pretty and that's why they're doing it. And you'll probably notice too that most of these spices, none of the spices are ground. Um, again, you're buying whole spices at the store. And so it's a little bit of labor saving just to put basically whole apples, skinned apples with the cores taken out, full spices, big hunks of orange peel. And the crust is essentially serving as a vessel to have all of that sort of stew together. And then when you serve it, even with the besprinkled crust, you're probably using a big serving spoon and just sort of scooping it out of the middle um, to get some of the sugary crust and then the whole apple in between. So of course in America, we highly associate pies with Thanksgiving and pumpkin and apple are usually the ones out there gracing the table. Um, out of curiosity, what pie do you usually serve at Thanksgiving other than a pumpkin or apple pie? Put it in the chat. Because historically in the 19th century, it was felt that it couldn't be Thanksgiving without a chicken pie. Pecan, pecan. Yep, I see a lot of pecans there. Any other ones? Ooh, blueberry, I love it. Michelle, my mom um, picks blackberries in the summer and freezes them so she can make a blackberry pie at the holidays, which I love. Love a chocolate cream pie, love a sweet potato pie, key lime. Sweet potato pie is very much, uh, sweet potato and pecan, or pecan is actually the, the indigenous, closer to the indigenous way of saying it. I oh, love key lime, love a little bit of like, acid to break up all of that fat and butter, right? Um, interestingly, like uh, celebrating Thanksgiving didn't really become a Southern tradition until the 20th century. It was seen as a Northern holiday. So it just definitely wasn't celebrated after the Civil War at all. Banana cream, oh, one of my favorites. So delicious. No chicken pies out there? So that seems like a funny one to add another savory pie to the situation. Um, but the fact of the matter was Victorian Thanksgivings were gigantic. People had big families, no birth control, religions that often ask them to have big families. And also people tended to live closer to each other, that uh, there wasn't much of an opportunity to travel far. So when you went to grandma's, there could be 30 or 50 people there for Thanksgiving. And turkeys just weren't big enough, although there are accounts of 30 pound turkeys. These were usually like multi-meat affairs where you'd have a turkey, but there might be a ham, there might be some venison, and there would be a pumpkin pie. Ooh, you usually have a pumpkin pie from Costco in Amish, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and a custard pie. Delicious. Turkey pie at the leftovers. That's a really good point. Shoe fly pie. Shoe fly pie is what we call a pantry pie. It's an, a pie that you can whip up at any time because otherwise pies are often highly seasonable. Think about it. Apple pies in the fall, berry pies in the summer, right? Um, and shoe fly is your like uh, very Amish, yes, but it's because it's a way to show hospitality with ingredients that you're going to have in your kitchen all the time. The shoe fly is basically sugar, vinegar. Am I getting that right, Suzanne? You can tell me in the chat. And in the meantime, I'm going to read you a description of um, open up wrong windows uh, molasses. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Um, just things you'd have in your pantry shelf at any time. 
Pork pie. Wow. Okay. So we do have some multi-meat Thanksgiving traditions. A couple years ago, I did a friend's giving that was a recreation of a documented 18th century recipe. And so we actually did multi-meat. We did turkey and we did a venison roast, which I thought was really, really fun. And also like, I, I should do it more too, because again, my family is in Ohio and everybody hunts out there. There's also a, the white-tailed deer population is destructive at this point. So venison is pretty easy to get if you know the right people. Okay, so chicken pie. So I'm sorry, I'm, I'm you, I love the pie conversation. I love the pie chat. So this is a description from Sarah Hale's book, Northwood. Sarah Hale is considered the mother of Thanksgiving. She's the one that petitioned, I think, 13 different presidents to make it a national holiday until uh, Lincoln did in 1863. And uh, Northwood is, is essentially about a New England Thanksgiving. And she said, the chicken pie is the pie which is wholly formed from the choicest parts of fowls, enriched and seasoned with a profusion of butter and pepper and covered with an excellent puff paste is like the celebrated pumpkin pie, an indispensable part of a good and true Yankee Thanksgiving. That is a large, long sentence. Um, we've also got a link to supermarket mincemeat, delicious. And yeah, Kim, what is bumbleberry? I think I missed that. Oh yeah, bumbleberry rhubarb. I know what rhubarb is. What is bumbleberry? I'm so curious. Oh man, I don't have any pie at home, you guys. What am I gonna do after this? I have to go get pie somewhere. <sighs> okay. So this is a really fun one. This is an early manuscript recipe that is called pumpkin pie. Um, but as you can see from the image, it's actually made with really thin slices of pumpkin and apple. Um, ooh, okay, I see it may be a controversial question popping up. What do you think about cheddar cheese with or in apple pie in some parts of the US? Okay, I've never had it, so I can't actually judge. And I am, to be honest, to be honest, not a super like sweet and savory person. I do, you know, like salt and chocolate, but I don't like my breakfast foods to mix, which I think is the, the biggest sign of if you like sweet and savory. Like I don't like maybe the syrup touching the sausages or the bacon or the eggs, black. So I'm not the person to ask about it. That being said, that's what it's based on. The sharpness of the cheddar sort of cuts through the, the tartness of the sourness of the apples. I think the fattiness adds something, the dairy adds something. Um, I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum. Okay, and bumbleberry pie is Canadian mixed berry pie originating from the Maritimes. Ooh. It is made of generally three kinds of berries, but generally first two is a mixed berry pie, as there's no such berry as bumbleberry. So sweet. The pie contains apple, rhubarb, berries, using this pie, blueberries, or strawberries. So Kim, you use raspberry, blueberry, strawberry mix, and cardamom. Kim, that sounds heavenly. I love that this is just descending into sharing pie recipes. That sounds so good. Oh, I'm going to have to make that soon. Okay. Apple pie without the cheese. It's like a hug without the squeeze. Polly, that's so cute. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay. So this is a early, um, a manuscript from Boston actually. So not too far from you all. Um, and it, uh, a woman named Mrs. Gardner, her recipes are from 1763. And so this is the first pumpkin pie recipe we have that we can consider officially American. And here's how it goes. Pare a pumpkin and take the seedy part out of it, then cut it in slices. Pare and core, pare and core a quarter of a hundred apples and cut them in slices. I don't know why she didn't just say 25. I love pros and recipes, but that's a little silly. Pare and quarter a hundred, wait, pare and core a quarter of a hundred apples and cut them in slices. Make some good paste with an egg and lay some all around the brim of the dish. Lay half of a pound of good clean sugar over the bottom of your dish. Over that, a layer of apples, then a layer of pumpkin, and again until the pie is full. Observing to put sugar between every two layers and all the remaining sugar on top. Bake it half an hour, and before you send it to the table, cut it open and put in some good fresh butter. So I have made this pie. It is delicious. You do have to cut the pumpkin really, really thin. You don't really want it to be any thicker than your apple slices. Um, and you want your apple slices to be on the thicker end because these are kind of cooking at different rates because you're just like putting raw slices of pumpkin in there. 
And then because you're putting all the sugar between every layer and then butter on top, it ends up making like this, I made it with brown sugar, like this gooey brown sugar caramel. It is a really lovely pie, really unusual. And one of these recipes that I love because it feels very modern, even though it's a couple hundred years old and very American and very New England. This is the first cookbook published in America, American Cookery by Amelia Simmons came out in 1796, a really fascinating book that's worth looking into. So you can see she's got quite a few pie recipes in her book, including uh, a minced pie of beef. Let's see what she used. Boiled beef chopped fine and salted, uh, raw apple chopped, alfo. If anyone wants to Google what that might be, <laughs> I would love to find out. One pound beef suet that went into the mincemeat, perfect. Also, oh my God, thank you, Suzanne, of course. It's the, how the book is printed using the particular, um, I don't even know what that would be called, the printing, the, the typography style of the time, the font, yes. Thank you, Suzanne. So six pound of raw apple chopped, also one pound beef suet, one quart of wine, okay, or rich sweet cider. Um, that means unfermented mace and cinnamon of each one ounce, two pounds sugar, a nutmeg, two pounds raisins, bacon paste, number three, three fourths of an hour. I mean, uh, that sounds, I don't know about the beef and the beef fat, but you know what? I would try it. That actually sounds really good. Okay. Her observation is all meat pies require a hotter and quicker oven than fruit pies and good cookeries, all raisins should be stoned. So raisins used to come with seeds and you would have to sit there with a needle and unseed the raisin by hand. So when we're talking about holiday food, and this is true today, even though we're not sitting there seeding raisins by hand, these are labors of love. These are really special foods because they often inquire steps and ingredients that are labor intenses. Um, okay. As it is difficult to ascertain with perfection the small articles of spicery, everyone may relish as they like and fruit their taste and suit their taste. I love, okay. So basically she's saying everybody likes to, to flavor things differently. So do what you want to and, and love it. I don't think we see enough of that in cookbooks nowadays. Things get very, very strict. And I think it causes a lot of anxiety in new cooks. And I love her invitation to, you know, take her recipes, but do what you want. Okay, so her apple pie, for example, uses fresh lemon juice. Oh, excuse me, the, the peel of fresh lemon, uh, lemon zest and rose water. I mentioned already that rose water was a really common ingredient in early America. We don't really see um, vanilla and especially not vanilla extract being used into the mid to late 19th century. So long before that, rose water and orange flower water uh, had been brought into Europe through the connections to the spice trade from the Middle East and India. Um, and then, so these, for these early British colonists, that was their sort of liquid flavoring of choice until vanilla extract come, came on the scene. And I actually love it. Um, oh, what does she mean by paste number three? So in a different section of this book, she lays out like 10 different crusts from like those really firm crusts to essentially puff pastries. So she's just referencing another one of her recipes, but another very kind of modern thing to do in a cookbook. I have made this recipe as well, and I actually love it. Um, I think that we associate the taste of rose water with often synthetic rose water that's used with a very heavy hand. But when you get real rose water, it's been distilled from damask rose petals and you use an appropriate amount, especially paired with apples and lemon, it really kind of adds an oomph to the citrusy, that bright citrusy quality. It's really hard to put your finger on. So if you wanna try something fun and a little bit out there, try adding a teaspoon or two of rose water. Thanks, Jess. Um, there is a link to the PDF of American Cookery in the chat right now. Um, really, she's got a ton of bake, baking recipes, some interesting flavor combinations. Also the earliest recipe for Christmas cookies, which uses coriander to flavor it. And they're, they're so good too. And also three pages of instructions on how to slaughter and butcher a sea turtle. So should you ever need to do that, that is in there too. And of course, pumpkin pie, or as the Americans were calling up at this point, pumpkin, which I think is the cutest variation on this word. Uh, one quart stewed and strained, three pints milk, six beaten eggs, sugar, mace, nutmeg, and ginger laid into paste number seven. Um, mace, actually, you know what? I'm gonna hold off on that because we're gonna talk about it. Okay, let's talk about Libby's and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, pumpkin spice flavors. And then we're gonna, we're gonna end on time too. So Libby's 
is the America's foremost seller of pureed pumpkin in a can. I know that regionally there's some other ones preferred. There are of course generic versions. Libby's I think is, the, don't go for generic version is what I'm saying. So usually butternut squash, which whatever, it's fine. But Libby's pumpkins have been specifically bred. They're an heirloom variety that is intended for pie making. And I credit Libby's with almost single-handedly saving pumpkin pie. Because how many of you have processed a fresh pumpkin from scratch to make pie? I have found it really labor intensive. And then when all is said and done, I didn't really detect any difference between, you know, these couple hours of work and opening up a can. Feel free to disagree. I have definitely had people say that they get way, way better results using their own pumpkins. But even for me, even if it's like a little bit better, it's not worth all the work. So if pumpkin hadn't been canned and hadn't been so good in a can, I don't think we'd be making pumpkin pies anymore, except for like really special occasions or people who were like super into big cooking projects. So Libby's started as a canning company in 1875 and they actually canned meat. Um, they were known for their trapezoidal shaped cans, which made really impressive displays in general stores. They didn't start canning pumpkin until 1929. And the first, um, Pumpkin pie recipe didn't appear on the can until the 1950s. So you can see in this ad for Libby's tomato juice, it's almost like an afterthought, even though uh, now Libby's is owned by Nestle and I'm pretty sure the only like Libby's branded things, yeah, canned is awesome, no pumpkin from scratch. Uh, but canned pumpkin is now the only like Libby's branded item. And notice too, it says pumpkin specially grown for pies. So that is referencing the Libby's select. Yes, Joanna, you're right. Hand is denser and less watery than fresh pumpkin, which, you know, is part of the process trying to get out some of that liquid. But so this plant is in Morton, Illinois, and 90 to 95% of all the pumpkins grown in the United States are grown in the county around Morton because they're all being like fed into this pumpkin canning plant. You do get to toast the seeds, Kim. That is true. Here's a Libby Select, which I've, I've heard described as an ugly pumpkin, but I actually think it's an interesting color. It's this kind of like tan on the outside, but then the inside is this really, really bright orange. And it is a less watery pumpkin, and it is a sweeter pumpkin. And it's an heirloom variety now that's been grown for generations um, that has been specially uh, de uh, designed, bred over years and years to be great for pumpkin pie. And then in the canning process, more of the water is evaporated out of the pumpkin flesh. So you get this really like dense, creamy, sweet pumpkin. Um, the one thing I'd recommend is I always hit it with a uh, immersion blender too, or throw it in my real blender, just to make it just a little bit creamier, which I think makes a difference. And I am a huge fan of pumpkin pies. So I love that there have been certain pumpkin pie innovations um, in the past few years. My favorite one came out about a decade ago, and that is the brulee pie, which in some ways references some of these historical recipes. This is essentially a pumpkin torch be sprinkled with sugar. And now since we can get little tiny blow torches, we can, you know, you go and you melt that sugar. And this is like basically pumpkin creme brulee. And in this photo, it's also in a chocolate crust. Um, oh, I will talk about, <laughs> I will talk about mates. Don't worry. Cause I know it's kind of a mystery. Um, another variation is a curry or chai pumpkin pie, which I think is really cool too, since a lot of the ingredients in pumpkin spice are Indian and Indonesian spices. So like, why not go all the way? Why not add some cardamom and how tasty that would be. And one of the wildest things to come out recently is the clear pumpkin pie. This was developed in 2017 at Alinea, the restaurant in Chicago, where they basically took the main spices that contribute to pumpkin spice flavoring, created a extract from them uh, using what's known as a rotovat. My brother's a biochemist. That's something he uses in his lab, but they basically used it to distill, like dis make a distillate. They used, uh, put spices in water and then steamed it. And then they put that into a gelatin. And the funniest part about it is when this first came out, I saw this photo and then I saw this photo. They're actually very, very tiny. <laughs> just like one little bite, which makes more sense. I think I would enjoy one bite much more than like eating through a full size jelly pie. There's recipes for this online now if you're curious to try it at home. Okay, so let's briefly visit some of the spices that go into pumpkin spice. So first of all, we have of course nutmeg. If you've got nutmeg at home, you should be keeping it whole. Spices stay fresh indefinitely when they're whole, but in particular, the flavor difference between a 
freshly grated nutmeg and uh, one that's been sitting on your shelf is really, really pretty incredible. Two totally different flavors. And you can just grate them with, you know, whatever like citrus zester or something you have around. I, of course, have a dedicated nutmeg, uh, nutmeg grater that is an 1840s design. Um, nutmeg is a fruit. Um, nutmeg comes from uh, Indonesia, I believe the Pandas Islands. Um, so you see the fruit in the inside, the nutmeg itself is the pit. And then this red membrane, that's the mace. So mace, although a common part of colonial cooking, um, is no longer really commonly used in broad American cooking. You do see it a lot in Caribbean and Caribbean derived cooking, and of course, Indian and Indian American cooking. Um, but I think one of the reasons we stopped using it as much is because the flavor is sort of similar to nutmeg, but different. And when we look at sort of our evolving kitchens, oftentimes when we're presented with two spices or flavors that are similar, but only slightly different, um, we tend to sort of discard one for uh, simplicity. Briggs would like to know, um, have you ever tried Japanese inspired pies such as kombucha pie? It's a Japanese pumpkin. I really enjoy Japanese pastry, but I don't think I've had any Japanese pies. So I'll have to look out for it. I'm gonna be back in New York City for a couple of days in December, and maybe I'll hit up some of my favorite Japanese bakeries and see what they have in stock. Certainly not anti-pie of any variety. So that's nice. It's a little spicier. It's a little similar to nutmeg. It's a little bit different. You can find it in usually in spice stores, especially if they're Indian or Caribbean spice stores. Um, but it is just a different part of the nutmeg fruit. And I think part of it too, is that nutmegs were incredibly expensive until the 1840s because they were grown in such a limited area in Indonesia. And so mace was like the cheaper nutmeg substitute. So after nutmeg trees were taken out of Indonesia and transplanted into Grenada and the Caribbean, then the, the cheaper substitute wasn't necessary. You could use the, the nutmeg pit. Ginger is a rhizome. It comes from continental Asia. What is the fruit like? I don't know. As far as I know, I don't think people eat it. And even in, I'm gonna go back. Even in this picture, it looks kind of dry and gross because I think when it is ripe, it actually splits like this. Um, so I have not heard of people consuming the fruit fresh. Could be wrong. Ginger's a rhizome. Rhizomes are underground stems. Um, turmeric is a rhizome. Cattails are edible rhizomes. Um, and so it, 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 even though it was originally came into Europe in a dried form, it spread a lot more quickly because it is pretty easy to grow compared to some of these other spices and much more widely spread. Ceylon cinnamon, a uh, true cinnamon comes from Sri Lanka and it looks like this. The rolls of bark have these sort of like feathery ends on them. Much of the cinnamon that we consume in America is actually from a tree called the cassia tree. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just in most other countries, Ceylon cinnamon or true cinnamon and cassia are labeled separately. Cassia has more of the really intense like cinnamon oil and um, cinnamon flavor chemicals than true cinnamon. True cinnamon is a little bit gentler and a little bit more floral. Like now knowing that there's a difference between the two, I often like, uh, I'll check the, the label. Usually something is labeled cinnamon on the front, but on the back, it'll say that it's like Vietnamese cinnamon or Ceylon cinnamon or something like that. And now I keep both cassia and cinnamon around because they have totally different flavor profiles and I use them, you know, Cassia if I want like a really assertive cinnamon flavor and Ceylon if I want something a little more gentle and complex. It is made from the inner bark of the cinnamon tree, the soft inner bark there. This is what a clove tree looks like when it's at home. Cloves are actually little uh, flower buds. You know, here they are full bloom, which I think is really cool. Um, the name comes from clavis, which is the Latin word for nail. Um, so, and they kind of look like little old fashioned nail heads is the thought. Another also was originally, I think from the Maluku Islands in Indonesia. So these spices that like, you know, have gripped humanity and we fought battles and colonized nations over, they're all like, most of them just grew on like one island, you know, and, and, and this completely isolated place that, wasn't, didn't appear on any of the other islands, only from this one place. It's pretty intense. So pumpkin spice as a concept starts coming about the turn of the century, basically after we have more laws that ensure the safety of food. Um, before the early 20th century, most people weren't buying pre-ground spices because they were easier to adulterate. They were buying whole and grinding at home. 
But after new laws go into place, um, then we see more of a proliferation of convenience food, and in this case, uh, pumpkin spice. So long before the pumpkin spice latte, you, you know, just bought the pumpkin spice flavor. And speaking of the pumpkin spice latte, I think one of the most favorite pumpkin pie related things that's out there right now, the most famous certainly, um, it is, even though there is pumpkin in it today, it was originally conceived as uh, the spices that go into a pumpkin pie plus espresso. Um, it was created in 2003 in Starbucks beta testing lab with a list of about 12 or 15 different flavors that they were user testing. Pumpkin spice kind of came in in the middle, but they ran with it because there wasn't anything similar on the market. And what they did is it was January, but they decided to decorate the lab like it was Thanksgiving. And all of the scientists brought in their family's pumpkin pie. And then they would all pour espresso on the pies and eat it, which sounds like amazing afternoon. And so then eventually that's when they decided they wanted to concentrate on something that's less pumpkin and more about the spices. Basically, as soon as the user tested it the following fall of 2003, it would sell out in the few markets they tested it. And like now they sell like 90 million of these a year. Um, it's known, what they put in there is known as a sauce, not a flavoring. And it contains, um, yes, these spices, but as we know now, we have pumpkin spice everything nowadays, although the flavor is only succeeding in a few, like coffee, beer, and baked goods is essentially, which makes sense where this flavor is succeeding and it's sort of shrinking in other markets. Although I did just see that Hefty released pumpkin spice trash bags this year. I'm not gonna buy them. But I do wanna share this really cool video that Times put out a couple years ago that explains the science behind pumpkin spice. Whether we're talking about Starbucks or any of the now, you know, thousands of different products that advertises pumpkin spice, this and that. And it's just a little bit about flavor science and how it all works. And I think that this just explains it much better than I could. Give me one second, I am going to share my sound. I'm gonna turn up my speaker and away we go. Nielsen reports indicate that pumpkin is rocketing toward its biggest year ever as a processed food flavor. The industry's biggest secret? There often is little or no actual pumpkin in it. Pumpkin's delicate earthy taste is too subtle to stand up to the heavier formulas in many processed foods. Instead, manufacturers opt for the potent in-your-face spices in pumpkin pie. Cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves. But even those things might not be in pumpkin flavor. A flavorist in a lab mixes oils from real spices or their synthetic equivalents with as many as 80 other additives to make pumpkin and flavor. The properties of these chemicals mimic the taste and sensations of pumpkin pie. Lactones lend a creamy sensation. Ketones create buttery notes. Cyclotenes, toasted maple-like notes that simulate the taste of the pie crust. Vanillin is a critical component. It's the soul of vanilla. And pyrazines, my favorite, for that intense baked top layer of the pie. But what's really driving these sales is something called LTO, or limited time offer. That pumpkin spiced latte isn't going to be available all year, so you better get it now. This short termness is one of the most booming sectors of the processed food industry precisely because it appeals to a younger demographic that's on the prowl for that something new. Now with pumpkin season upon us, one manufacturer has already moved on to its next LTO, pecan pie stackable crisps. Fascinating, I think. Um, that we're not, it's not just the flavor of pumpkin spice, but in some products you're trying to actually imbue the sensation of eating a pumpkin pie. There we go. Um, I'm gonna answer one more question that I see is so great. What is the shelf life of spices? You're supposed to ditch any open spices you have every six months. Now to know that that would take like, you know how restaurants have labels for like first in first out, you date everything. Maybe not a bad idea to date your spices when they come in. Spices are, of course, expensive. So do I throw all my spices out every six months? No. Does that mean that they're not anywhere near as potent as they could be? Yes. You don't even know with a ground spice, you know, how long it's been sitting on the shelf. 
but if you're using whole spices, they, they have an basically an indefinite shelf life. So any whole spices you have, you never have to get rid of. You can grind them as you use them. They're great to have around. The ground ones, they get stale, unfortunately, pretty, pretty fast. Um, and often that changes the flavor because certain ingredients oxidize or evaporate certain um, aspects. Uh, what am I trying to say? Certain chemical components that make up the flavor of say a cinnamon stick or black pepper is one that I know of. Like black pepper over time becomes not more spicy, but the pungent spiciness is the only thing that's left. Whereas freshly ground black pepper is a much more complicated sort of complex floral, herbal, there's a lot more things going on than just like spice or heat. Ooh, gently roasted expired old spice to bring back freshness. It's Rita, fun. As always, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I desperately want pie and now I have to figure out what to do about that. You can always find me on my social media. I'm on Facebook um, and Instagram. You can either look me up as Sarah Loman or you can look me up at my handle four pounds flower and you'll find me. And thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Jess. Thank you, Sarah. That was so much fun. So much I'm fun. I'm so happy we did this. Um, yeah, me too. Well, I'm we, looking forward to hearing more about everybody's holiday recipes next month too. Awesome. Yeah. So don't forget on December, what did I say? I'm sorry. Um, December the 15th, um, Sarah will be back with us to talk about holiday traditions and I'll send out this recording tomorrow. Yay. Thanks everyone. Have a great Thanksgiving and I'll see you in December. Thanks, everyone. Good night.